Peace, 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 family. It is yours truly, Amar Amari. I am the CEO of Synergetic Network Group, LLC, where we are your community liaison for entrepreneurs and consumers. And it's on once again. We have Prince Dykes on SNG Highlight on this afternoon coming to share with us some financial tips. And um, hopefully, you know, you learned something on today prior to the end of this session. Um, as we all know that financial illiteracy is an issue that has been plaguing our community for centuries. And so as we all know, this is a solution based uh, ministry here. We, we don't come on here to complain. We come on here to uh, solve the problem. So we have a, a solution for you on today. And that solution is financial expert uh, Prince Dykes, who has been in this industry for numerous amount of years. Okay, definitely is a professional. Um, has his, uh, he earned his associates and bachelor's and master's in business administration series 65, series 63, insurance license and certified financial educator, instructor, accredited financial counselor while serving in the United States Navy. Now, I'm not going to hold that against him. <laughs> I'm not gonna let it, you know, even though the Marine Corps is a part of the Department of the Navy, you know, he could get me with that one too, you know. But how how you doing, Prince Dykes? I'm doing outstanding. Thank you uh for the for having me. I'm definitely blessed to be here. Definitely. Uh definitely, definitely, man. You certainly are welcome. Man. You know, I tell you, family, um, he has a powerful YouTube channel called The Investor Show. Okay, and as him and I was discussing prior to us coming on this program that I learned so much from Prince Dykes. And I'm not just saying this, I'm serious, family. That's why I have him on here. And I've listened to numerous financial educators and, and no mark against them. You know, uh, they can only speak according to their level of knowledge. But I promise you, in such a short period of time, I had learned so much from listening to Prince Dykes, you know, and um, listening to the investor show that I just had to have him come on here. To be honest with you, I just rolled the dice. OK, because you're, you're listening to someone today that has interviewed uh, personalities, mega personalities in the financial arena, such as Warren Buffett, Robert Kiyosaki. OK, also had interview with with famous Amos, uh, the owner, of famous Amos, you know, as well. Uh, did an interview with Tyrese Gibson. OK, so I want you to know that you're dealing with a heavy hitter. Also, uh, Terrell Davis, if you don't know who he is. The NFL Hall of Famer running back for the Denver Broncos has co-signed on his children financial investment book. Listen, family, you're, you're, you're dealing with a person who is one of the world's first. OK. Uh, financial investors, children book authors here on this platform today. So I definitely highly encourage you to listen very attentively to what this gentleman is saying. He have a whole lot to say in such a short period of time. I know I watch his show. <laughs> he get in and he get out. So, so Prince Dice, you know, uh, talk to us, you know, how, how are you doing today? And um, talk to us about how you started on your financial journey. Well, the first thing I want to say, I'm having a pretty good day. You know, Apple is doing very good today. Uh, Uber, not so much. It has its own problems, but Apple is doing it, it very well for me today. So it started my day off very well. Uh, Sound like day somebody day. making some money over there. Yeah, that was, <laughs> I, know, was very, I, I am very shocked by Apple. When I purchased Apple, I was not expecting it to do what it's been doing in the last month or whatnot. But I, you know, hey, I take it. Uh, Tesla's been the same way, but um, you know, hey, you know. It, wow. So you uh, actually did you get in with Tesla when they first started? No, I didn't get into Tesla. I didn't get into Tesla until January of this year. Uh, Tesla, okay. You know, Tesla was a big, unprofitable company for years. Uh, mm. but I, I wasn't brought into the system. I hadn't brought into the company. And the next thing you know, uh, in January, when the stock really started to take off the end of last year, when January, mm -hmm. came, I said, I'm going to look at these finances when they come out on the earnings report. And if they up the snuff, I'm, I'm going you know, to slide in. And it was mm. about, about six, seven hundred bucks uh, when I slid in. I did a broadcast. Wow. I did a broadcast. You got in at a good time. Yeah, it was around six, seven hundred bucks then. And uh, it just, you know, I, I did I expect, I said, hey, it's going to be a long run. Did I expect to be at two thousand dollars in the next two, three months? No. But uh, mm. it's a hot stock. It was running. It turned profitable. 
is making his money. Then no. Also, this is what other people don't think about when you look at Tesla. Tesla, you know what did the what did Trump just create? You know this as a military person. The Navy, we got Navy, we got you know our Marines. Mm-hmm. They're part of us, but uh, you got <laughs> Navy, <laughs> you got the Navy, Air Force, Army, and Coast Guard. But le- lately, they've been talking about um, Space Force. Trump created the Space Force. And when you look at all the companies out there, the government, as you already know, the government loves to outsource everything. Hmm, and that's now, a fact. Our priority is on space. And you look at the most prioritized company in space, you got Tesla that's out there. The only I heard they went into the technology arena. Yeah, they, you know, they're the only ones that's going up to space and we're looking to dominate space. So uh, that's another aspect. But, you know, it, it was up to snuff. The company was profitable. It's not the best. on the, it, don't, it doesn't have the best books in the world. But uh, it, it got very exciting. That's all I can say about it. So Wonderful. Wonderful. So that being said, family, you know, again, um, you know, he was featured also on, on blacknews.com uh, as well. Um, so this this children book, Wesley Learned, this children book series is, is phenomenal. OK, um, you know, when 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 you have, you know, the the mayor, Mayor uh, Carswell, hopefully I'm saying his name right. Is that correct? Mayor That's Carswell, correct. Mm-hmm. you know, co-signing on this book, you know, you 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 had Terrell Davis. You know, uh, doing an interview with him, you know, on Fox 31 in Denver. OK, talking about, you know, this children book series It had it made such an impact to where uh, some of the schools have added it to the curriculum. Is that correct? Yes. Actually, Terrell Davis is actually a character inside of my third book. So uh, he's wow. actually part of the actual uh, third book. I had met him. I think that's about two years ago now. And uh, he saw the first two books. I was working on the third one. And he said, mm-hmm. you got to put me on this this third one, the, your next one. And I thought he was joking. I said, hey, you know, okay, he's probably playing around. But he was serious. And uh, he came through and we, we – Yeah, that he was. We launched it on the uh, – we launched it at the Broncos Boys and Girls Club. So it's in a good bit of Boys and Girls Clubs out here, a couple of libraries, a couple of schools throughout the years. And, uh, you know, the series is just – the whole series is just – continue to go and it's the wow. world first the world's the world's first children's book on insurance so absolutely now that is very impressive man for you to be so humble and and to 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 uh have uh met figures like such as himself and then warren buffett and, and robert kiyosaki you know you know talk to us about you know how, how that came about you know how you had connected with such you know heavy hitters in the financial arena a lot of it was, I, I, you know, a lot of it was a lot of luck, preservation, timing, um, just, just hang. I guess you could say being in the right place at the right time, and being seen by the right people. I would guess uh, it was no type of strategic move like, oh, I'm going to blah 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 blah, then I'm going to go meet with this person. It's just um, I had always been doing my things. I, I, I was around. And when the opportunity prevented itself, I just happened to be the right place at the right time. So it was like a divine purpose. You know, it was just some great people. Uh, some mm-hmm. great people looked out for me that said, you know, uh, it was really the connection really started with Miss Buffett. You know, uh, I had lunch mm-hmm. with Miss Buffett. And I didn't know it. So uh, <laughs> I, was, I was there to meet somebody else and she was there, you know, and I didn't know who she was. Um, and then she's just like, you know, my husband got to meet you, you know, and I was just like, I'm like, who was her husband? You know, she said, Hey, I'm, I'm Miss Buffett. But I was like, What? Like, <laughs> she was like, Yeah, she was like, Now, oh. see, that's the reason why you need to be on your best behavior. You know, there's a, a person that right? said you attain the angels on the way. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, know you, you never know who is who or what could be done. And stuff exactly, like that. And, uh, it was the most inopportune time. We were just sitting there having burgers with this guy I was supposed to meet. And the guy I was meeting with, he knew it, but he didn't tell me. You know, he, he didn't tell me. He just he just put me in position and, uh, you know, it just went down like that. That was the Buffett situation. Uh, the Terrell Davis situation was I, I just went to the Broncos stadium. I had just moved to Denver. You know, I'm stationed here for mm-hmm. two years. I just went to the Broncos stadium. My first ever time going to the Broncos stadium, I heard he was doing like a real estate event. So I just went there and I went in and boom, he just started to, uh, you know, we met that way. Uh, I mean, the list just goes on. Famous Amos, he was on Shark Tank. I was a finalist for season seven Shark Tank. 
and but I didn't, yeah. I didn't make the show. Uh, but during that process, I was watching, uh, which I was watching Famous Amos, and he just, you know, I reached out to him. He just said, Man, I, I only had one book at that time. He really loved the first book. And when he saw the first book, he said, Hey, Prince, man, I, I think this is great. I wish I'd have known this. He didn't discover Famous Amos until he was 49 years old. Wow. He, he said, I didn't have the financial literacy and the financial knowledge of, you know, what I was going to be faced upon. So he loved the yes. first book. He ended up hosting the second book. And we just we just went from there. You know, I noticed that what you said is very significant mm -hmm. because everyone who I heard in your interview kept saying the same exact thing that they wish they have known that information when they were children. I want to send a shout out to Atlee Joseph. Mm -hmm. um, he said, good to see Prince Dykes on the show. He's one of the members of Synergetic Network Group LLC. He's our technology guru there. You know, so uh, he's definitely a fan of you as well. So uh, getting back to it, Prince Dice, you know, when, when you grew up mm -hmm. and I noticed in your interview, too, you said you wish you have known that, too. So so what what is the effects that you've seen in, in your surroundings of financial illiteracy? Well, it was I learned fast. All, of, all my mistakes in life have been done by what I didn't know. And I had great parents. My mom, my dad, mm -hmm. my mom, she passed away in 2013, but my dad is still here. Condolences. I, and thank you. But uh, she well, um, I had great parents. But one of the things they really didn't talk about, they really wasn't big on investing. They just said, hey, mm -hmm. work, save your money. That's it. And that worked in that era. In the 80s, in the 70s, when a savings account were earning 3%. 2%, 1%, you know, now savings accounts, you're lucky if you can get 0.5%. So my, uh, you know, my mom didn't really, I don't remember getting any lessons on investing. Mm -hmm. I didn't get introduced into stocks. When I heard about stocks, it sounded like it was something that wealthy people did. Real estate sounded like something extremely wealthy people. Mm. people that was in my close vicinity were just trying to make it day by day. Mm -hmm. you know, they wasn't, mm -hmm. Nobody really was talking about, I mean, some people were just trying to get a pair of shoes you know, they're not even thinking about, oh, let me get some land thriving. Everybody was surviving. Nobody wow. was thriving. Wow. Everybody was so concentrated on just, you know, getting the bills paid, getting the necessities. Nobody was thinking about thriving for tomorrow down the future, down mm -hmm. the road. So it wasn't really something that was around. I mean, I mm -hmm. didn't really start thinking that investing, you know, I remember my MBA when I was 28 back in 20 in 2012. It wasn't wow. around that point that I started to look at the investing world different. I said, wow, you can really invest. And um, crazy place was I really was in Iraq in 2008. Right. Mm -hmm. And when I was there, you know. Wow. I was there, too. You was there in Iraq? <laughs> I sure was in the same year. Same year, 2008. I was there. And, you know, at that time, the world looked like it was coming to an end. We was in two wars. Gas prices was through the roof. We was coming through a new election. It, you know. Banks were going bankrupt left and right. I thought it was the end of the world. So mm. stock market was just crashing left and right. I didn't know what to do. So, but I had mm. some buddies around me that were talking about investing, but it intrigued me. I said, okay, well, well, how do I invest? What do I do? And you know, and that was like my first point where I really got intrigued of, of trying to learn because mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, I was debt free. I didn't have any debt, single. Mm -hmm. I didn't I wasn't married or whatnot. So I just had a bunch of money just piling up sitting in the desert. And wow. I was just thinking, like, well, what can I do with this? What am I supposed to do with this? You know, mm. and it became, wow. so you asked you asked the right questions. Yeah, I was kind of like, well, what am I supposed to do this? And then somebody, uh, one of my supervisors said, get a mutual, get a mutual fund. I got a mutual fund and I invested into it. And all I kept seeing was the mutual fund drop, 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 drop. Mm. I said, man, what am I doing investing into this mutual fund? And it's just dropping. So I sold it. One of the dumbest things I could have done. Right. Uh, Mm -hmm. I sold it, you know, because what my mom had put into my head before I left home, she said, son, stay away from stocks. You don't know what you're doing. You'll lose your money. I said, okay. So I tried it. And then when I saw the mutual fund dropping and dropping and dropping, I immediately thought, man, she's right. My brain went back to that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, could, I could have just saved this money and been better off. I didn't understand compounding interest. I didn't understand business cycles. I didn't understand what it, that this was a cycle. I didn't understand that an expansion, a peak growth. I, didn't, I mean, expansion, peak retractions. 
uh, consolidating. I didn't understand none of that stuff. I didn't understand that we was moving. I'm 22, 23 years old at the time. I didn't know what this was. and But the, the interest stayed there because I started to notice, what are the wealthy people doing that I'm not doing? Mm-hmm. And then wow! Again, world. again, man, you you asking all the right questions. Yeah, so what, what, are the wealthy, like, what are the wealthy people doing? You know, I'm like they're not scratching off lottery tickets, they're not rolling the dice and trying to figure out the next thing. And they all had four things in common, or at least three things in common. Definitely, they all was in real estate, they all was in stocks, and they all was either had their own business or invested in somebody else's business. And mm-hmm. when, I, when I saw that, I said, well. I need to get in the stocks. I need to get in the real estate stocks business. I don't know what mm-hmm. I want to do yet. And the easiest one to get into is stocks. So that's when I said, okay, stocks don't require a lot. It don't require a credit check. Anybody can go set up a brokerage account, put money into it, and start investing. But mm-hmm. this will try first before I go off into everything else. And then once I started to discover it, I said, man, why did my dad just buy Nike stock? And why did my dad buy Apple? And why didn't we you know we had all these products? We I used to love McDonald's when I was a kid, right? Mm-hmm. And then my dad would tell me, he said, son, you know, I, I didn't know I could do that. Hmm. It, it always intrigued me if my dad had known that, how could it have changed my life? Wow. And I, theirs. And, and theirs. theirs. And then he, he said, son, I couldn't just pick up a phone. He's 74. So he said, I would have had to drive way to Atlanta, get some stockbroker. Then I got to subscribe to the Wall Street Journal to know what the prices are, what's going on, stuff like this. Uh, so it wasn't as simple as it is for us today because you had to go to a broker back then. You had to have a broker. He, You know, uh, Internet wasn't in houses like that back then. You know, it was around, but it wasn't what it is today. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so he said, I had to really go out of my way and trust some people or trust somebody that I really didn't know. I really didn't know that much about it. So I said, well, what if my, what can I do so I can run across the next parent that could change the course of their child's life? Mm-hmm. I realized the only way to change the future is to change the children. Yes. And thus comes the birth then mm-hmm. of the book, Wesley Invest, which is, which is named after your son, mm-hmm. you know, yep. which is very powerful, man. You know, that, that's something that, that really had moved me. You know, as as a parent myself, mm-hmm. you know, who who loves his son, you know, and also building generational wealth for for uh, my son and, and now our children, now that I'm married with a blended family, you know. So, you know, that that really had touched me, man. You know, like uh, what had inspired you to use his name, you know, as as this character mm-hmm. of the 11 year old uh, that's in the book, Wesley Invest. You know, what What inspired you to do that, man, to, to name it after him? We were on YouTube together. We was on Facebook. We was on YouTube together. We started in 2013, right? Mm-hmm. And I was going on deployment in 2015. So in 2014, I was thinking, like, well, what can I kind of create to kind of put out there that, uh, you know, that could be pretty beneficial? And the thing was, the whole industry was geared towards adults. Adults trying to learn this. Adults trying to learn this. Adults learning to invest. Adults learning about their credit. Adults learning about insurance. And I said, what if we did something for kids? And I said, why? Yes. And my son would bring home all these books from school. And these books would be, you know, the cat jumped over the hat. The dolphin played with the tiger. You know. <laughs> Is a happy <laughs> all play together. I said, I was like, man, you know, I said, man, in real in real life, man, you're gonna be running across some real stuff here. So, what if I did something to teach you about something that's actually can help you in life? I want to plant these seeds early. You don't know what I'm talking about today, but I want when you turn 30, 35 years old, you'll be like, Wow, my dad did all of this, right? He was telling yes. me this. I wanted to play back in your head because. Mm-hmm. I want you to buy insurance, not to be sold insurance. Mm-hmm. I want you to go in and buy an investment, not be sold an investment. So you mm-hmm. already know, hey, I already know what I want to do. I just need somebody to facilitate it for me. Ah, so you filled in the gap. You seen that that financial uh, illiteracy me, this was, plaguing, and I would just tell you to, filled it in. I was talking to it, not to cut you out there, but I was just talking to you good? Uh, uh, Acorns yesterday, the app Acorns, right? 
And one thing I said, we're the only industry, the financial industry is the only industry where you have to educate somebody before you can sell a product. You know, when somebody go get their oil change at Jiffy Lube, they walk in, hey, I'm getting the oil change. They're, okay, cool. Finances, you got to say, okay, so this is what investing is. This yes. is what stocks is. This is what the S&P 500. When you walk into a barber, they don't have to tell you like, hey, Amir, you need to get a haircut because this is going to help you so much. It's going to make you look better. It's going. Nobody else has, no other profession has to do that. Everybody walk into every profession knowing exactly what they want and what they're going to get. Finances is like, okay, all right, so you got, this is life insurance. And what this is going to do is blah, 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 blah. See, this is your credit. This is why your credit is important. See, mm-hmm. investing, you know, this is why you should purchase a house in real estate and land because it can go up in value and it can appreciate. It's the only, before you even can sell the product, you got to do this whole educational piece. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes it becomes frustrating like, man, why can't I sell a product like everybody else? <laughs> You know, and that's yeah, put that work in. <laughs> you, 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 you ask yourself, like, well, how did this person get to this point? Mm-hmm. How can I stop them from getting to this point? To where now, you now let's let's take a let's take a pause there because you mentioned land and what was brought back to my remembrance, man, is, is something very significant mm-hmm. when I read about the backdrop of your life. And and um, I, I went on to your website, which is here, family, for those who want to visit this website. It's right there, www.theinvestorshowtv.com. Okay, and that's why I went and I found this information. And he had a total of three steps um, as it relates to how uh, you can use those three steps to purchase a property for your child. So let's talk about that, man. You know, that, that was very significant to me a very big step you took there. You know, um, why did you do that? And why is that important what you did for your son purchasing a property? And I heard too, that he wasn't too happy about that with that birthday gift. <laughs> I heard Wesley wanted him a cake or, or something. You know, he, he wasn't too happy about that. It's like his mom gets all the cool points because she'll mostly buy him the cake and the, you know, the, the, the toys and stuff like that. And I'm the one that'll be buying McDonald's stock. And I'd be like, well, he always asked for McDonald's. So, it was a whim. It was a joke when I brought McDonald's back in 2015. It was one of his birthdays. I think it was like 2015, 2016. Mm-hmm. And I'm not a big, but every time he would always ask me for McDonald's, Daddy, can I have McDonald's? He would drive by, can I have McDonald's? He, McDon- he just loved McDonald's. <laughs> that sounds like me, bro. I was like that too when I was young, man. I, I was the same way. I said, you know what? Since you asked me for this much McDonald's, I'm going to at least buy some stock in this company. So for you and your investment account, and I just brought it, and kind of forgot about it, and it's done, you know, pretty well over the last couple of years, right? Awesome. And he's gotten dividend checks from him, and you know, stuff like that. Dividends being reinvested. So his last birthday, I was like, "Well, what do I want to do this time? I know I got your stocks and stuff like that. What can I do?" So one of his birthdays, I added him to my credit card to build his credit. Then it was this particular birthday. I said, "You know what? We need to get into real estate." Mm-hmm. You know. I can't buy you a house. Mm-hmm. But I can buy you some land. So mm. I went and I went searching around, find some land. Mm-hmm. Wasn't the most prettiest land, just any piece of land. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, I went through and I purchased the land. I put his name on it. You know, I'm the parent. I mm-hmm. put his name on it as a custodian. He purchased the land and he took it home with him. And not took it home with him, but when the deed came to my house for the land, it had his name on it, stuff like that. I, I framed it. I actually got it right here. No, that is that is awesome. So I framed it. And I put it up on the wall, and you know, with his name on, I said, "Hey, son, oh, you know- somebody wants to buy some land in for their child. Mm-hmm. They just need to be the custodian." Yes, yeah, be the custodian. You know, I would just. So we are pretty much. Uh, we have a joint and tenancy rights of survival. Joint tenancy right of survival. Meaning that if he was to die, the land comes to me. Like we own it jointly. If something, if he was to die. I'm the I'm the owner. If I was to die, he's the owner. Mm-hmm. Right? So a joint tendency of survivor. Then on top of that, uh, as he gets older, I can easily write it off to him. And he could just have it as his. He can do whatever he wants to do. So uh, that's what I went through. I just went through the process of purchasing a piece of land. I did it all online. To be honest with you, Amir, I never even saw the land. Mm. Right? <laughs> I didn't care. You know, it's about five hours away from me. I said I was going to go one day. Never went. Right. <laughs> 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 but 
this is the crazy part. A year or two later, we've gotten proposals to purchase that land from us. So wow, that's awesome. So the land appreciated then, because you know a lot of people really don't know that that land appreciates. Mm -hmm. You know, just like uh, a house does. Yes, and it's a hard asset. Is it has multiple facets. It doesn't, you know, with a stock, I only can make money if Apple goes up, right? Uh, or like say Uber, if Uber goes up, I make money. If it doesn't go up, I don't make money. But with land, if it doesn't go up in value, I still can utilize it. I can't mm -hmm. do anything with an Uber stock if the value doesn't go up, it just sits there. But with land, I can grow on it. I can uh, live on it. I mm -hmm. can use it as collateral to get a business loan. Um, I could maybe, I, and I even could sell it. You know, mm. so it has multiple facets more than the traditional stock has. Yes, indeed. So earlier, um, because being that you're a financial educator, you know, there's a there's a lot of uh, swindlers out here. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I noticed in there it says you you had the uh, uh, the the administration, the series 65, series 63. You know, and you and I had a very nice dialogue in that regard, you know, so so could you tell us what that is? And, and if you would, please, uh, Prince, tell us why. Why is that important to know somebody's credentialing mm -hmm. when they're seeking them out for their uh, quote unquote professional guidance, if you will? Well, I would say this. Um, just because you got a driver's license doesn't mean you can drive, but it means you're held to a standard. Right. So. Do you need a driver's license to say that you can drive? Probably not. You can learn how to drive without a driver's license. But when you have your license, it shows that I'm held to a certain standard and I should know better. Right? Mm -hmm. If I go outside and run a red light, I can get a ticket because they say, hey, you got a driver's license, you should know better to run a red light. Right? Mm -hmm. Versus um, some people, that's what the credentials do for you. It's the same thing when you become a doctor. You become a doctor, a medical doctor, you get a license. The reason why you have a license is to show that you can be sued for medical malpractice. You are held to a certain standard of knowledge. This mm -hmm. is not your cousin down the road who read a couple books. No, no disrespect. A cousin down the road. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, who read a yeah, you tell books. the truth, brother. You tell the truth. He read a couple books. Now he knows this. And your cousin may have had all the best intentions. But let's say if he made a mistake, right, which professionals do as well. But you're held to a certain standard when you go out and achieve your license. Number one, it shows that you are serious about your craft, right? You can't get an MBA overnight. You're not going to get your Series 65 overnight. You're not going to get a Series 63, a credit financial counselor, chartered portfolio manager, asset management specialist. I need to update my uh, bio too because I got some other things, right? <laughs> it shows that you are serious about your craft, right? It's the same thing with but like they like to call them in the Navy sea lawyers. A sea lawyer. Versus yeah, a I remember that. <laughs> a sea lawyer versus a jag. Yeah. The sea lawyer may know yeah, more. Yeah, people talking about what they heard, not what they know. Yeah, see, but versus someone who takes their profession serious, right? They take their profession very serious, and they go out and they seek to become, become further educated. So um, a Series 65 is a license to hold assets. Right. You have to have if you're taking money from the public series 65, you have to hold assets. And plus the difference between a mirror who holds assets and Prince Dykes who holds assets. If I was to act with out of the fiduciary standard, I can go to prison. Hmm. So when I sign up for these licenses, I said I would act within the best interest of my clients. So if I do something that was not in the best interest of my client, I can go to jail. Wow. Because you went out there and got the license. Same thing. You can get pulled over and go to go to jail for going too fast because you have a driver's license. So knowing someone's license, they're held to a different standard. That's the biggest thing. Secondly, when I look at someone's credentials and education, doesn't mean you're smart just because you have education. It shows that you're dedicated to your craft. Right? Like you mm -hmm. say, you go back and you say you watch the investor show. It's been around for years and years and years, right? Yes, yes. And it shows that that's not somebody who learned how to option trade two months ago and now is telling everybody and selling all these wild courses and right. all the stuff that now something he just learned. Like now he has, he's seriously turning himself into a professional and he's learning himself and he's watching himself over and over and over. So Wonderful. that's why, you know, when people see, and I always tell people, don't invest in startups. 
I hate to say it, do not invest in the startups. I'm sorry. If you are a new investor, right? You are, if you are a new investor, do not invest in the startups because that's for the high level. That's where I made mistakes at, right? Mm -hmm. Watching Shark Tank, got excited. Man, that's cool. I love finance. I love investing. I would like to invest into a company that becomes XYZ. Those are the people who are at a certain level to do that. You got to get to a certain level to do that first. You got to crawl before you walk. Those people are walking. They can just throw $100,000 into a company, and they know 98% of those companies are not going to make it, and they can just be fine. But you coming up as a brand-new investor, mm -hmm. you get what I like to call for show, though. Mm -hmm. For show, though, is companies that's for show making money already. They're mm -hmm. already proven. Right? <laughs> I like that. No, no offense to Amir, but you got Amir Burgers versus McDonald's. As a new investor, where should you start investing? McDonald's. Because you can look at the finances. You know, just, go ahead. You know, I have to ask you about that because, you know, and I'm glad you're a financial expert on an investor because I actually heard, mm -hmm. you know, that when you get new companies coming out like that and you see potential, that you should take, you know, a, a risk at it because they said that's where you know, the money is at too. If you see potential in that company and blowing up, it's not when it's already there, it's when it's on the rise. Okay. So so wouldn't that actually kind of wouldn't it kind of uh uh how, how you want to say it, it it would it would it will only be the situation, if you will, depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. Well, when you come out with a brand new company, that's called an IPO, initial public offering. You got Airbnb. Airbnb is going to be coming public this year. Robinhood is supposed to be coming public too, right? Mm -hmm. So Airbnb will probably be the hot IPO of this year and next year. If you're a brand new investor, if you're just starting to invest in a day, and you're like, I want to give a shot on Airbnb, that's a lot of risk for just starting out in your portfolio. That should only be done with no more no more than about 10% of your portfolio should go to a risk like that. In the beginning, you should be getting things that are already proven, right? Because mm -hmm. I did that. I did those dumb things. I came in, I got the penny stock. <laughs> all that, all that, that's how I can speak on because I did all that stuff. Right? When I go to school and I, yeah. go, I do a I don't read how many books. I don't read so many financial books. I go to formal school and get the education. Then I go informal. And I can mm -hmm. see myself all the time. So I know to mind a majority of investors. They're like, oh, Airbnb could become the next big thing. Apple is already big, right? So mm -hmm. people are like, well, I want to get the thing that's going to become up. So let me go get this penny stock. Let me go get this new company. And then what always mm -hmm. happens, you know, like right now, I'm invested into Uber, right? Mm hmm only a small portion because Uber is unprofitable. It's small. Uber could disappear just like that if they can't figure this whole thing out with California, right? Now, can we take, can we pump the brakes just for a moment? Because I know some people out there may not understand the jargon that you're utilizing. So when you say unprofitable, why, why do you say that that company is profitable? And how do you know that that company isn't profitable? If you would, please. I would tell you this 90% of the people that buy stocks don't know anything about the finances. Yes. <laughs> so you first thing you do is look at the pe ratio the pe ratio is the price to earnings ratio if it's zero or negative that company is unprofitable meaning that yes they're probably making money but they haven't turned a profit yet you know it's just being profitable like uber is unprofitable apple is profitable right you know it's very profitable so it's not about how much money you're bringing in how much money you're keeping so the company is bringing in a hundred million dollars but once it pay all of his bills and stuff like that, it's at a negative twenty million dollars. Mm -hmm. Net, you know, now it's netting a loss. Now the company is not profiting from its operations. It has it's making enough money to stay alive, but it's not profiting from its operations, right? Mm -hmm. And what I like to do, I like to see companies who's already making money and their money keeps growing, and their money keeps piling. Those are good companies, right? Mm -hmm. So when I look at that, um. Why come in and jump in the hottest new thing in the beginning? You start off with the little things. Of, uh, you start off with the little things first. Then as you become more seasoned, it's just like imagine your son comes to you and says, hey, dad, I want to start investing. So I think I'm going to go buy 300 lottery tickets. You say, son, why would you buy lottery tickets? Right. That's right. Why would you buy lottery tickets? He'll say, well, dad, look, 
I could win a fifty million dollars. You're like, yes, but there's some more things you should start off with first. You mm-hmm. know? So being a new person coming right in and saying, I want to get on the next train. It's nothing wrong with that. But I always tell people, don't buy stocks, build a portfolio. Build a portfolio. So when you build that portfolio, you allocate maybe 10%. If you got a $10,000 portfolio, you allocate $1,000 to the side just for something crazy. Oh, Airbnb is coming out. Maybe I might try it. I might try this Uber thing. I might buy some Bitcoin, some cryptocurrency. But the rest of my portfolio is dedicated to things that are making money, paying dividends. Wow, that that is that is definitely powerful. So in, in your professional opinion, mm-hmm. because I hear this this um, back and forth in regards to trading, because you have the foreign exchange trade mm-hmm. um, and you have the stocks, you know, from from your professional opinion, um, how do you feel about about trading and stocks? And if you if you would, please uh, share the reason why behind uh your choice between the two first you got to ask yourself are you here to make money or grow money so somebody who's here to make money mean that i need money today so i can pay for i need money today to so i can pay my mortgage right versus someone who's trying to grow money means someone who's already been able to they can pay their bills they're looking for their money to just go up like this. They're looking to grow their money, putting in places to grow. Like, take me for a prime example. I went, I purchased land not to make money, right? Think about it. You don't go buy a house. You don't go buy a house so you can make money. No, you're not going to make money by buy a house to live in, what I mean. You don't mm-hmm. go buy a house to make money, you know. But yeah, it'll grow an asset. So if you buy a house like me, I purchased a home, I live in the home, it grows in equity. That money is growing. If I wanted to make money instead of purchasing a house, I would have bought, I would have purchased a rental house. There you um, go, investment property. I would have bought an investment property to create a cash flow. Traders are trying to create cash flow. Investors are trying to create growth. So first, you got to decide what do you want. I want a cash flow. Now you can't get a little blend of both by buying. You know, I'll talk about that later. But first, am I here to make money or am I here to grow money? If mm-hmm. you get to, I want a cash flow. Now you can look into trading. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But keep in mind, I know you see all that stuff on the internet when people are saying 95% of people that trade are losers. What? Ask yourself this question, Amir. If everybody can open up E-Trade account and start making all this money, Wall Street would go broke. Mm -hmm. Why do you think Airbnb is going public? Why do companies go to the stock market? Simple question. How do, why, why do you want your company to be traded on the stock market? Mm. They go there to make money. Mm-hmm. They go there to raise capital, right? That's why they go there. They go there to make money from Wall Street. Mm-hmm. If all these people that's online is out here taking, yeah, you will make money. Don't get me wrong, but you're going to mm-hmm. net a loss. Mm. 98%, I want to say about 90, 90, 95% of people who day trade are losers. Over time, when you draw them out over a year, look at Warren Buffett. He's a buy and holder. Nobody can beat him, right? Mm-hmm. Why can't nobody beat him? Because he don't day trade. So the, nothing's wrong with day trading, but you have mm-hmm. to know what you're going up against. Know right. that you have a 95% chance of losing when you day trade. The more mm-hmm. you open up that account, the more you touch it, the more likely you're probably going to lose. Mm-hmm. And you got to understand that and know that when you walk in, it's just like buying a lottery ticket. Now, there are five percent. Shout out to Oliver Les, who can log in and take money out of the market every single day. Think about it. It's like this, Amir. Some people can go to the casino and make a living. You know what I mean? Yes. Some people can go to the casino, sit down and play black, blackjack and make a living. But the other 95 percent of the people that come to the casino, they're going to lose. <laughs> they gonna have to that that was an excellent that was an excellent analogy because you the truth is you are really taking the gamble um gregory <laughs> jenkins he said i needed this knowledge yeah so when you walk in there just notice what you are up against you might be in that five percent that can trade every single day make money every single day right but majority of the people it's just a proven fact. That's why I love finances because you can be like, oh, Prince don't know what he's talking about. It's numbers, man. It's numbers. Yes. <laughs> you yes. can go 
and you can look at what people that they trade, most of them make money off their courses or whatnot or whatever the case may be. But if mm-hmm. you're in there, you will have a good day. Mm-hmm. If you get in there, option trade every day, yes, you will have a good day. Yes. When you zoom out, you're going to realize you're going to have some losses. Yes. Right now, Absolutely. I'm doing very good on the Apple option. If I go in there, but this, but I got burned on Amazon, right? Mm-hmm. So Wall Street is there to make money. If everybody was logging on to TD Ameritrade and E Trade and just mm-hmm. printing money, Wall Street would be bankrupt. <laughs> but it ain't bankrupt. So all hey, the- if, if you would, can you talk to us not to cut you off? But I would love for you to talk about um how does because I know a lot of people don't understand this. How because even me, I'm guilty of that. Like I must admit, like when I heard of before I started investing, I didn't know how important wall street is to the economy and i'll be the first one i don't mind admitting that you know so so why um is it like when you know the market crashes why does it cause so much chaos to the economy because the wall street is the heartbeat of our lives wall street is the heartbeat of our lives what do i mean by that Mm -hmm. your 401k everybody's 401k what is it connected to? It's connected to the uh, to the stock market. All stocks, right? Yes, mutual funds, IRAs, Roths, funds, IRAs, all that, right? Nike is invested into who? They're invested into another company. Mm-hmm. It's invested into another company. McDonald's. Who pays McDonald's? Where does McDonald's have its money inside of Bank of America, right? Mm-hmm. So everybody is connected into this chain. Hmm. Hmm. So if McDonald's goes away, how many jobs go away? Right? Hmm. How many jobs go away? If Facebook goes away, how many people will lose a job? Look at Uber. Uber and Lyft goes away. How many people will lose their job? It's the hmm. heartbeat of everything that we do. Hmm. So when it goes, with the when the market goes down, it's the only investment you're going to make in the world that's going to be on the president's desk every single day. Hmm. Stock market crash tomorrow. And like, if I go invest into Amir's barbecue, and he, you know, coronavirus comes around and the company goes under, nobody cares. But if I invest into the Nasdaq and the Nasdaq drops fifty percent right now, as we're speaking, it is the first thing on the president's desk mm-hmm. to get that Nasdaq back up, right? What is the Nasdaq all about? Whenever you get the opportunity, would you please <laughs> drop a jewel on that one? Then after that, we'll. We'll wrap it up after that one. Okay. So the whole thing is when you look at everything we do in the world, every the facet of our lives, everything is connected back to stocks. Back who whoever controls the money controls the world. Everyone mm. knows that. Mm. We mm. have a military. Facts. If, if we were to lose our military today or tomorrow, our economy will go to crap. You gotta have muscle. But who controls the money? When you're negotiating, who whoever is paying the money. Makes the rules, you know. So mm-hmm. now you got to where is our money? How is our money tied together? Look, when 2008 happened, they had the financial crisis. Every day you woke up, it was a new bank going bankrupt. It was Bank of America. It was J.P. Morgan. It was Wells Wells Fargo, Washington Mutual. You you can see the domino effect. You can see the chain, right? Because guess what? When you uh, when you take your money, right? When you take your money, what is um how do you think Ford runs and operates? Who lended them the money? Bank of America has lended Ford the money. Ford mm-hmm. goes bankrupt. That means that Bank of America can't recoup. Now that Bank of America can't recoup on the money that is lended, because it lended money to Ford and GM or whatnot, it can't recoup its money. Now it's having problems. Now it goes under, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now when people see a bank go out of business, what's the first thing everybody do? That's what happened in 1929. When people see, a, like if you was to go outside and see a bank say, close for business, mm-hmm. you saw everybody outside, the first thing that's going to come to your mind, what about my bank? What about my money? Is my money safe? So you run to the bank, you go take your cash out. <laughs> yeah, that's how about like what had happened when, when the, the word was out about that happening that people needed to do that or something. Yeah, everybody was trying to get cash, trying to get cash. And that can drop the economy because the banks don't have that much cash on hand. That's what happened. That's why you got to be a historian. 
That's what happened in 1929. That's why in the act of 1934 and 1940, they created the FDIC to say, hey, don't worry, we will insure your money up to $400,000 for this type of account XYZ. So when you look at it, finances is the backbone of our existence, our everyday lives. That's why when it goes, when it goes, he's right, everybody wanna go take their money out. So that's why you have to be very, very mindful of, um, you know, it's the hottest thing on the market. It's the hottest thing that's going around because it's the heartbeat. The stock market go down, everybody's 401ks go down. People mm. retire, people got issues. So you mm -hmm. know one thing, that's why they try to stimulate it every time it takes a downturn. Okay, the last nugget. Mm -hmm. um, which which vehicle do you recommend uh, for people to invest in as far as like an IUL or a Roth? You know, because there's a lot of financial vehicles out there, you know, from your financial expertise, mm -hmm. which one do you think is the better fit for somebody who's looking for um, them being able to mitigate taxes um, and to be able to uh, grow their money and, and then to be able to stay away from all those penalties when they withdraw their money? OK, IULs are great. Right. But this is the thing about IULs. IULs, it costs more to have an IUL. Now, most people are not disciplined. So I would say uh, IUL, let me give you the pros and cons of both. IUL is great. It's an insurance product. It has a cash value. It can grow in value over time. It can turn into an annuity at a certain age and pay you for the rest of your life. Right? Great. Mm -hmm. It's great on taxes. Mm -hmm. It's great on liquidity because you can borrow from it at any time. Also, it's great because you can lower your payments and up your payments however you want to do it. Right? Mm -hmm. But the downside to an IUL is over the time, you're going to be overpaying for insurance because it's a whole life policy. Mm. The other way to work around that is you can get a term. You can get a 30-year term and then just invest your money properly. But most people are not disciplined to do that. Mm -hmm. People are more loyal to bills than they are themselves. So mm. an IUL is a bill that you got to pay. So mm -hmm. They feel comfortable with paying that. But a Roth IRA is something that you got to pay yourself. People will skip out on that at any time, right? Now the IUL, good. You can it'll defer your taxes. It can grow. It can grow. Uh, you pay your taxes before the money goes in. The downside is you can't touch it until you're 59 and a half, unless you're purchasing a new home, unless you have some type of disability or whatnot, or whatever the case may be. But you have to wait till you're 59 and a half to be able to withdraw on it. Um, and uh, but. You won't pay as much as fees, depending on what Roth IRA you have. I don't know. I can't speak on everybody, but I can say military Roth IRAs, the fees are very low. You can make a good bit of money. But the downside is um, you, your money is going to be locked away. You can't touch it for like 59 and a half years. I mean, until you're 59 and a half years old, depending on how old you are. Some people don't like that. But the, the plus side of that, it's a tax advantage. Now, if you want to get the facts of the IUL, you could just go ahead and invest your money and then go get a term policy. You can go get your 20, 30 year term policy that's going to be significantly cheaper, mixed with a Roth IRA, you can kind of get around it that way. Hmm. And then what happens is when your Roth IRA, when you turn 59 and a half, you live off the interest. Right? You can just say, hey, I plan on living until I'm 90 years old. How much can I withdraw before I go broke? And financial calculators, you can figure that out. So you invest into it, get it as fat as you can, then, it, you know, when you get up to $200,000 or whatever, a million dollars, whatever you have, by the time you're 59 and a half, you take that. If you have Social Security, if you're still around, you take Social Security, your Roth IRA and your pension. And that's how you can retire yourself. So they both have their pros and cons. But at the end of the day, in investing, always remember, it's good, better and best. Even at the bad end, it's still good. If you got an IUL, you're still doing better than sitting in your checking account. So you got good, it can be better than you have the best option that's out there. And that option varies depending on the person. It's not cookie cutter. So it depends on the person. Like take yourself, you retire, uh, you probably got a military pension, you probably got a VA pension, and then you probably can invest money to where you fit down to have, you can get a Roth pension or whatever other pensions you can have. Versus somebody else may not have any of those pensions, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it varies to the person. Wow, that, that was powerful. So again, family, uh, you listening to Prince Dykes. He is the founder of the Investment 
show, please make sure you follow him on YouTube. Um, I also provided his websites that's there. Um, you could get the books from uh, Wesley Learns to invest.com. Okay, there's a series. Um, make sure that you're investing in your children and your grandchildren life. Um, Prince Dice, we thank you so much for my queen, Amani, Amari, and I. Uh, we thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom and your understanding about uh, finances. And, and in your closing remarks, if you if you would, please, you know, share uh, a nugget with someone that you feel like they need to know before we sign out on today's session. I would say, remember this, the world of investing comes down to three places. It may seem like it's hard and convoluted. It's simple and easy. Real estate, stocks, business, pretty much it, pick one. And always align yourself with what the government aligns itself with, with its monetary policies. Get married, stay married, try not to get divorced, right? The divorce, that's the one way to lose all everything. So one, married, own some real estate, own some stocks, own a business. Own, get married, own some real estate, own some stocks, own a business. The reason why I say that is married people get tax breaks. Stock market gets stimulus packages. Small businesses get stimulus packages. Real estate is part of the stimulus package as well. If you're single, you don't invest, you can't take any advantage of any monetary policies. So you didn't create the game but learn the best way you can play it in the time you got left on this earth. Yes, indeed. So we thank you so much, family, for everybody tuning in. Thank you, Amity, for tuning in. Tammy Buckley as well, the author of From Brokenness to Wholeness. Make sure you check her out. Um, go check out her website. She has a powerful book. Um, I believe that will bring healing to your life. Again, this is yours truly. I am the CEO of Synergetic Network Group, LLC, where we are your community liaison for entrepreneurs and consumers. For those who would like to come on this platform and to highlight your business, we're here for you. We're here to help our people to build business-based generational wealth as well as building wealth via investing. Again, make sure you go check out Prince Dykes. Follow him on the Investor Show. We thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you, Gregory. Jenkins for tuning in. Thank you, Luis Ramos, my fellow Marine Corps brothers. Thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate y'all. Everybody, you have a blessed day. Signing out. Till next time.